Welcome back to ASA 184, coming to you from Chicago. These are our final press conferences of the day. Um, so after we hear from each presenter, again, we'll have time for your questions. If you're on the live stream, just put those in the question box. Um, first up, we have Georgia Zalo of the University of California, Davis, who's going to explain how humans communicate with voice AI systems in this new robot era. So Georgia. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm Georgia Zalu. I'll be presenting my work on clear speech with technology. And this is a collaboration with Dr. Michelle Cohn, who she's in London right now. Michelle and I do our work at the UC Davis Phonetics Lab um, on PI, and she's currently a postdoc there. And we have a big group of um, students who help. Together, we study the linguistic, social, and cognitive factors that shape how people talk with voice-activated, artificially intelligent, or voice AI systems, like Siri, Alexa, and Google Assistant. They're becoming increasingly commonly used by people of all ages, especially in the United States. Um, and in this uh, work that we're doing, particularly for this presentation, we're exploring how um, we speak clearly uh, in a different way towards a voice AI machine than we do towards a human. So uh, in linguistics and phonetics, we think a lot about clear speech. So clear speech is a special kind of speech style that consists of acoustic enhancements made to improve the intelligibility for the person that we're talking to. Um, clear speech is slower, contains more extreme vowel and consonant articulations, um, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's being produced when we're talking to someone who we think might not understand us, um, or in background noise, and also to a computer. Um, in turn, we also look at how clear, clear speech benefits listeners. So when we record clear speech and we look at how people make these different modifications, then we play them to listeners and we show that indeed clear speech is improved. So looking at the production and perception of clear speech can tell us a lot about linguistic communication and how that works in real time. Um, so here's kind of what uh, I talk about in this talk is we look at the production and perception of clear speech uh, when we interact with digital devices. So starting with production, this paper was published in Journal of Phonetics. Um, Michelle was the lead here with a student we published this. Um, and in the second study, um, we had lots of people help us with this study. Uh, so what we find is when we record people talking to a device and we compare that to how they talk to a human and uh, uh, just simply producing words, we find that when people talk to Siri or Alexa, they produce louder speech, slower speech, speech with higher pitch, um, and in some ways a narrower pitch range, kind of like almost like they're trying to be clear, but also want to be a little bit robotic, like the machine. Um, so we are finding that people do produce like a special type of clear speech to devices. We have a special device-directed speech register, kind of like a special register to babies or older people, and also now devices. And we were also interested in how does interactions with devices affect listeners' intelligibility. Um, sometimes when a device talks to us, we don't always hear it, and we want to understand what are the factors, the acoustic factors that could uh, vary intelligibility. So we ask, is there a clear speech for device voices that would benefit listeners? This study was also published in 2020 in Interspeech Proceedings and also a separate paper that occurred in JASA. Um, basically, what we find is that we can, we can take different types of text-to-speech, or TTS, generation methods. One is like an old-fashioned sort of concatenative, where they just sort of cut out speech and splice it together. That's how they made the original Siri and Alexa voices. Compared to the more naturalistic and human-like um, neural TTS that people use every day, increasingly more and more, and um, one is actually more clear than the other. And you know which one it is? It's that older version. So it's that older concatenative TTS, even though it sounds really robotic and sounds really telegraphic. When we actually compare um, that to the neural TTS, we find that listeners perceive it better. So even though this modern, uh, wide, industry widely used neural TTS um, is more natural, uh, it's not actually better perceived by listeners. So there's a lot of work to try and understand how we can make um, that improve. 
We did a final study where we played people TTS voices. Again, we wanted to test how we can improve their intelligibility, but we did a trick. We um, told some people these are devices. We told some people these are real humans. And what we found is that when we told people that these device voices are real human voices, that actually improved intelligibility. So in addition to the actual acoustic properties of device speech, we also find that simply thinking that you're talking to a human involves better comprehension. So there's some really interesting questions that arise here. And um, yeah, so we're interested in sort of both sides of the equation, how people produce speech differently when talking to devices, and what are the ways that we can uh, understand and improve comprehension in this new digital era. So thank you so much. I will open for questions now. Thank you, Georgia. Um, so I'll start off with, I guess, um, like, what uh, what can this be kind of used for in the in the future in the realm of communicating with AI? How why is this important to understand? That's an awesome question. Um, so there's two kind of aspects of that. Again, one is the production side. So um, these devices, systems like this, use another thing, not TTS, but they use something called automatic speech recognition, whereas that they turn our speech signal, our acoustic signal, into text so that the device can understand us and then answer us so that the interaction takes place. Um, but every time we produce a word, literally every time we say the word dog, we produce it differently. So there's a huge amount of variation in speech. And one of that very, one of type of that variation is that we might talk differently when we talk to devices. So right now, the way that the ASR is trained is on lots and lots of speech, but not necessarily device-directed speech. So if device-directed speech has a specific constellation of acoustic modifications, then help that can improve um, whether had the communication between a device that can could improve that type of technology. On the other side, for the perceptual side, um, lots of different people interact with devices now. Hearing impaired individuals, L2, so people who are learning English or learning the language that the device is speaking in um, as a second language, um, children, and all of those are different types of communicative situations that could make it harder for a user to understand the device. And if we know that a certain type of um, speech pattern is actually better for users in intelligibility, rather than the one that's more naturalistic, which is being adopted industry-wide, that's kind of really important in, from an engineering perspective. So yeah, there's lots of practical, not just scientific, but practical reasons why we want to know how this happens in communication. And so I imagine kind of a follow-up to that, that it would be kind of more difficult to train an AI to recognize uh, speech directed at a robot because just like the uh, data set is smaller than just like people talking normally is that the case yeah exactly the the these companies that make these programs have uh, they actually have huge amounts of data set and they're I think they're increasing the amount of device directed speech data because they are catching on that that will improve it but exactly like if we can sort of not just train it with lots and lots of data, but also guide that training, sort of um, give it some structure and say, these are the features that can tell you, you know, that, you know, um, can help you improve communication. That will be really important. Um, I'd also like to point out that um, just in the U.S., but also worldwide, uh, people speak differently. So not everyone speaks with a, say, mainstream or prestige variety of some language. And um, you know, understanding the type of variation that people use when they talk can improve communication and accessibility and usability of these devices for all kinds of people, not just people who use like one specific type of variation of their language. Yeah, you mentioned L2, which yeah. goes along with my question. Yeah. Have you done any studies with non people speaking in their non-native language? Because I think I do use Alexa in my non-native languages, and mm -hmm. I don't find in English 100%. I know I speak to it differently, but in my non-native ones, I don't think I'm flexible enough to do that. Interesting. Yeah. Have you looked at people using their non-native versions to see if they still do this transition? We we have looked at that and they do. So I mean the devices, the, the ASR is just overall like not as good with people who speak either accented 
um, some deviant from mainstream or the most prestige variety of a language, and that includes other accents of English that are not California, um, uh, you know, Caucasian um, English, but also people who um, are speaking English who have a um, L1, have a first language that's not English, so um, a non-native accent. Uh, the devices, the ASR systems are, have, are not tr as well trained on those accents, and so absolutely communication uh, is uh, more challenging. Um, and your, sorry, your question was, have, have I looked? Yes, we've looked and we do find that um, people, uh, uh, L2 speakers also produce a clear speech. Interestingly, it's, it's similar to that that L1 speakers do. So there's, there's something universal about how we modify our speech to try and be more clear. Um, but because L2 speech is less intelligible, it does improve it, but not enough to get it up there with the L1 speech. But definitely, you know, we want to work towards understanding that more better. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, thanks. Uh, we have a couple questions uh, from the virtual audience, but Can you hold on one second? yeah, we just need to take a little pause. Can I add something, or are we just waiting? Just wait for a minute. Oh. <laughs> All right, so the question I have is from Rick Lovett, uh, and we're wondering, um, do the devices need clear speech for their own processing? Or do we just do it because we think we should? This kind of ties into another question we have, wondering if the change in speech is a conscious mm -hmm. effort. Yeah. Um, uh, so we're we're working on testing that question whether devices actually do, you know, uh, recognize clear speech better than than not clear speech. Uh, that's an empirical question, and we're working on that right now in my lab. But the question about whether people do it. Uh, to act, whether it actually improves is actually irrelevant to the fact that we do adapt our speech based on perceived, the perceived communicative need of our interlocutor, right? Um, so, uh, you know, for instance, uh, we have something, we do something called pet directed speech. <laughs> we modify our speech when we talk to our, 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 our Fido, our dogs, right? Um, that's not helping, that's not benefiting intelligibility for the dog, but rather there's lots of other reasons why we might produce clear, a special type of register, which is to draw someone's attention or to create some sort of emotional connection or just for us, right? So um, that's, we sort of have these, um, ha these uh, registers that when we're in a certain context, we produce speech differently because we, we think we're doing something for the interlocutor. Oftentimes it can help, but that's not often. It doesn't always have to be helpful for us to do it, but yeah. It again sort of gets to this idea that we have this idea, we have a conceptualization that a device is going to have a hard time understanding us, um, and that's why we change our speech. It comes from our expectations, and it tells us something about our mental representations and how that affects how we talk. Thank you so much. Okay, thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you, Georgia. And we'll be back in one moment with our next presenter. <laughs> 